in the beginning, part 17, theos theistic evolution, is it a valid option? Uh, we've been reviewing the book in the beginning, subtitled Science and Scripture Confirm Creation, and it's by Brian Ball, uh, who edited it, and of course a lot of other people, Brian Ball has um, had a varied career and has gone on to be president of the South Pacific Division. And uh, the book itself is mostly about theology. It talks about evidence for the faithful transmission of the text, arguments against higher criticism, and for a view consonant with Jesus in the New Testament, which of course argues for a short age for life on earth in terms of creation. Uh, it does include scientific chapters by Tim Standish, Grenville Kent, John Walton, James Gibson, and our own Ariel Roth. And uh, it also deals with evolutionary morality and theistic evolution. We covered evolutionary morality two weeks ago, and uh, today we're going to be covering <coughs> the chapter on theistic evolution. Uh, the chapter is written by Lael Caesar, who got his bachelor's of theology at Caribbean Union College, and then an MA in religion at Andrews, and then an MA and PhD in Hebrew and Semitic studies at the University of Wisconsin in Madison and is currently research professor of Hebrew Bible at Andrews University, so he knows his Old Testament and his Hebrew well, and is also associate editor of the Adventist Review and has been since uh, Roy Adams uh, retired. Um, the chapter that we're discussing will talk about theistic evolution. Now, evolution is already a word with uh, multiple de definitions. Uh, Near as I can understand uh, Dr. Caesar's use, he uses it primarily for um, large, the large evolutionary story, which is, you know, a Big Bang going on to um, uh, the spontaneous origin of life, followed by the spontaneous uh, diversity of life uh, without uh, any kind of uh, intelligent intervention and specifically without the intervention of God. And also its most common subtype, which is, of course, the restricted idea that talks about after the origin of life and where we got, uh, how we got to where we are now. Theistic evolution is also uh, a vague term. And in fact, uh, um, there's some confusion that can happen when uh, Dr. Caesar cites Frank Francis Collins to define theistic evolution, and uh, it sounds like he's going to talk about uh, Francis Collins's brand, but he actually criticizes uh, William Dembski's brand more. Dembski has come out with a, a, a defense of intelligent design. Um, and so, in a way, he's not talking about evolution in the standard sense at all, but he is talking about long ages and how to fit them together. Uh, a word about uh, Dembski is that his, uh, he has said that he would be a short-age creationist in a heartbeat if he could figure out what to do with the ages. Um, Dr. Caesar's comments are thus directed at two different groups, and if you keep that in mind, it may help to uh, 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 make more sense of what he says. Um, the old theistic evolution, which is that God guided the process or perhaps intervened specifically and uh, in ways that you might even be able to, to tell, but the other one is the newer theistic evolution, which is what it uh, if you're not careful, it sounds like he's primarily talking about uh, if you come from certain kinds of backgrounds. Um, and that is the idea that God simply set up the process and then let it go and didn't intervene in any way. And uh, that's the kind of theistic evolution that many people would associate with people like uh, 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 Keith, uh, this is Miller, um, i trying to remember his first name. Keith Miller, uh, Finding Darwin's God. 
I, I probably have the wrong, I, I'm sure I have the wrong na first name, but I can't remember what his first name is. Uh, a Brown University, anyway. Well, that's, uh, you know, that's, uh, uh, we went through uh, finding Darwin's God once, and that's kind of what it sounds like. Uh, also Francis Collins, but. I noticed that neither of these two definitions of theistic evolution really fit the Adventist version of it. I uh, know um, they don't, and, uh, and uh, Dr. Caesar is going to talk about that. But the, the, reason, the reason I want to point it out is because if you say certain things, it sounds like you're, uh, if you're, uh, you're assuming one kind of theistic evolution versus another kind. And that's why I'm pointing out that theistic evolution, uh, much as uh, short age creationism, has different variants. And you have to be careful of, of uh, which variant you're talking about. Uh, there are some things that are common to all variants, and I think that he will make some points that are valid for all of them. Um, Dr. Caesar begins, the question of theistic evolution is a valid option, it contains theological implications for historic Christian belief, and in that context, for Adventist theology in particular. We begin by clarifying these three elements, which will provide the framework for our discussion. Theistic evolution is the view that in the history of the universe, evolutionary de development, that should be a comma, whether physical or biological, has involved divine intervention, however minimal. Given its variant forms, a specific dictionary definition of TE may serve less well than Francis Collins' articulation of the six fundamental elements of his worldview. And they are, the universe came into being from nothing about 14 billion years ago, However improbable, it, it appears precisely tuned for life. Over long ages, life mysteriously came to be, and through evolution developed biological diversity and complexity. No special supernatural intervention was needed once evolution got going, and that's a disputed premise, and uh, Dembski in particular would dispute that premise. Humans are part of this process, sharing common ancestry with the great apes. And finally, Human uniqueness is proved by our spiritual nature, the universal consciousness of moral law, and an equally universal longing for God. So this particular brand of theistic evolution has two interventions, one at the very beginning, um, if you want to put it that way, at the Big Bang, where the universe was precisely designed for life, and it has one other intervention at the point where humans develop morality. Historic Christian belief is belief rooted in the centrality of Jesus and his teachings and believing as he himself believed according to God's every word. For historic Christianity, the Bible is the written eternal word of God and Jesus is the word made flesh. From the written word, Christianity dis understands that the entire universe is the product of God's command so that the phenomena of nature are a third book from which to learn of his power and purposes. So the historical Christianity does uh, look at nature some. Martin Hanna's work on reading God's three books is instructive. Hanna shows that scripture's epistemology, epistemologic primer, primacy, Jesus' ontologic primacy, and nature's chronological and contextual primacy all deserve our full respect. We live in the context of nature, and that context existed before scripture was written and God incarnate was revealed. Jesus is the supreme revelation of the Father, but the Bible is equally God's own statement of truth and of the life principles bequeathed to mankind. Adventist theology, briefly stated, Adventist theology is only fully understood in the context of historic Christian belief itself, and is also derived only from the Bible, resulting in faith in the one creator, Lord and Savior, there revealed. Adventist theology recognizes God's unchanging character as expressed in Sinai's permanent and universal Ten Commandments. Though Christians in general hold this moral law in the highest regard, Seventh-day Adventists specifically remember the sacredness of the weekly Seventh-day 
as a sign from the Creator God of both his creative and redemptive power, and as stressed in the fourth commandment. Again, while historical Christian belief has always known God as a God of judgment, Adventists recognize in the biblical teachings of the sanctuary an outline of God's plan for the sanctification of his believing people and for the ridding of the universe of sin. Historical Adventist uh, theology understands the three angels' messages of Revelation 14, 6 through 12 as God's end time judgment hour message pointing them backwards and forwards back to the Sabbath of creation and to pass universal judgment at the flood and forward to history's final climax and the last judgment. Belief in Christ's second and imminent return accounts for the Adventist emphasis in the name of Seventh-day Adventist. It is to be stressed that at the Adventist distinctive theological emphases only have meaning in the context of historical Christian belief correctly understood and in the centrality of the faith in the historical Jesus. And then he will elaborate historical Christian belief because this is fundamental in Adventist, Adventism, a specific denominational expression of basic Christianity. And because theistic evolution is now considered by some as a potential articulation of historical Christian belief, the latter requires some elaboration against which to judge the claims of theistic evolution and Adventism for that matter. Following the, that elaboration, uh, Dr. Caesar will focus on the hermeneutics of uh, theistic evolution, theistic evolution's principal reason for being, and finally, the dissonance between theistic evolution and selected Christian doctrines. As already stated, the source and focus of Christian doctrine and behavior is Jesus Christ, presented in the scriptures as God's anointed uh, son and humanity's redeemer. Theistic evolution appears to understand this. Uh, Christianity, as its name suggests, is primarily about Christ. Jesus is also called Christ because he's believed to be God's spirit anointed one, Greek Christos, put to death on a cross, but raised on the third day in fulfillment of many Old Testament prophecies and now God's appointed judge of the living and the dead. And I'm skipping some because uh, we don't have time to read the whole thing and if we did, we wouldn't have any time for uh, discussion. The focus of this chapter does not allow further elaboration on Christianity's beginnings, but no discussion of theistic evolution's significance for historic Christian belief is practical without awareness of that historical Christianity is a humanly inconceivable, uh, I think that I would have said in that setting, a humanly undiscoverable without help, a body of belief known only by supernatural revelation that invades, enlightens, and transforms humanity. It is not a denial of human categories, but a demonstration of divine power beyond human categories and expectations. And it is Christian most of all because it is rooted in its central figure, Jesus Christ, Lord of all. The significance of Christ for the reality of historic Christian belief is obtrusively demonstrated in historic Christian belief's earliest known formulation of its fundamental beliefs. And he's going to give the Apostles' Creed and note that it asserts the creatorship of God and then dedicates the core of its confession and more than half of its entire statement to the person of Jesus Christ. I have formatted it slightly different from the way the book has, but so that the, the Christian part, the, the Christ part, is all together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And then I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He descended, ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. And then, some miscellaneous, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, Catholic simply meaning universal in this setting, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The, 
This centrality of Christ the incarnate word is paralleled by Christianity's regard for the scriptures, the written word that validated his existence and testified to his life and teachings. In the Emmaus encounter in, recorded by Luke, Christ did not draw attention to his resurrected self as well he might have done. Instead, he reminded these two disciples of Chris, scripture's testimony concerning his messiah, messiahship. Shortly thereafter, he explained, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, insisting that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. For Jesus, the Old Testament was essentially about him. Contemporary Christianity cannot then be any less about him if it follows his lead in advocating the authority and the teaching of the written word. And then some hermeneutical considerations about theistic evolution. This chapter proceeds on the basis that the Bible is a unique and supreme document of the Christian faith. Its testimony, like Jesus' life, is internally consistent, and its teachings, as already indicated, are the touchstone of Christian belief, the canon by which that belief is judged, as other writers in this book have demonstrated. How does theistic evolution relate to such a hermeneutical foundation? Well, theistic evolution, as it has developed until now, is seen, at least in one view, as a theistic reaction to a deistic theodicy expressed through evolution. Um, Charles Darwin, um, and that's his ellipse, by the way, presented what we might call the evolution theodicy, which uh, distanced the creator from natural evil, just as Milton had distanced the creator from moral evil. Darwin's worldview was not revolutionary, but Darwin did find a way to describe his worldview using scientific terms. The idea that God must be aloof, separated from creation, now became respectable. With evolution, science's stamp of approval gave further credence to the idea of a distant God. Theistic evolution and historical Christian belief both highly regard God's book of nature. Consistent with the Bible's claim that nature <coughs> reveals God's glory, uh, William Dembski states that God gave humanity two primary sources of revelation about himself, uh, the world that he created and the scripture that he inspired. As such, theistic evolution sees itself as a defense against atheism, reacting against the thesis that no God would create the world that we know. The hermeneutics of theistic evolution attempt to reconcile the chaos of the evolutionary scenario to the order of the biblical revelation and the love of the biblical God. From a theistic evolution reading, the biblical text is said to establish a real deity as opposed to atheism, a God who is apart from nature over against pantheism, and one unique deity instead of the polytheism of surrounding nations. Theistic evolution contrasts with deism in which God had, has had nothing to do with the universe since starting its clock billions of years ago and with belief in a recent creation where God created what we know as the biochemical order of life here on Earth a few thousand years ago. The perceived objectivity of science dominates theistic evolution's hermeneutic, in ex exercising definitive influence upon the interpretation of scripture. But theistic evolution's eagerness to identify with the supernatural, while insisting on the reliability, even the priority of human observation, does present an awkward scientific peculiarity. I stated here with unequal treatment due to limitations of space on three grounds. First, according to Stephen Jay Gould's dogma of sympathetic, interdigitating, but non-overlapping magisteria, uh, as he calls it, NOMA, Mathematically oriented, orientated science is fully justified, independent, and autonomous. No theologian or churchman should put it in question with reference to a higher authority. That is, any high authority, including God, Bible, Pope, or church. Indeed, as Karl Ratzke has put it, perhaps the most formidable obstacle for theological thinking is the epist epistemological challenge posed by modern science. Science and its empirical questions are not to be confused with the human heart 
and its existential moral and ethical concerns, to which the Bible as a religious book may be permitted to speak. So that's uh, non-overlapping magisteria. The problem is that it's overlapping, as he notes. Unfortunately, for those who attempt such category distinctions, the question of origins is supremely an existential one, or even a series of existential questions. Where have life and humans come from? Why and how are we here? Whether, if anywhere, are we bound? These are all existential questions. However scientific, the process of analyzing the DNA molecule, describing what it does and of what it is composed, hardly answer the existential questions. And whereas the most complex molecule itself is evidently live matter, clearly a matter of life, religion must be within Gould's specified bounds to address its existence. In other words, the religion magisterium does overlap science in some places. DNA's connection with every living thing and person validates such inquiry. If not, Mathematically oriented science, as it's been called, has arrogated to itself the right to determine which points in life and which, what portions of life are to be treated as life questions. Atheistic evolution's reply that there is no purpose to DNA is something of an existential or perhaps anti-existential response. It may also be declared something of a manifest untruth in that there is functional purpose to the molecule, which is obvious. In all of this, the greatest irony must be the employment of reason to prove life's meaninglessness. Theistic evolution's contrasting answer that God is involved rightly perplexes both atheists and others whom theistic evolution would convince of its scientific credentials. Such is only one aspect of theistic evolution's scientific peculiarity. A second aspect is the necessary but difficult question as to why at any given point in the process of evolutionary development, divine intervention is legitimately allowed. Given theistic evolution's scientific dedication, how does it scientifically determine these points of divine activity so essential to its basic thesis? In short, how can evolution be harmonized with divine intervention? It was designed to keep it out. Space limits our pursuit of the answer, but the question is sufficient in itself to underline the problem. The third inquiry may well be paramount. How could a paradigm designed to explain all things on a naturalistic grounds while retaining divine intervention claim to eliminate the miraculous by demonstrating its naturalism? Such a conclusion demonstrates the human capacity for circular reasoning. A priori rejection of miraculous explanations guarantees that, in the end, no miraculous explanation will be accepted. If you start out by saying you won't accept it, then of course when you get done you won't accept it. Uh, it is difficult to identify which Christian doctrine or which essential element of historical Christian belief is enhanced by sympathetic association with this intellectually bewildering blend of dedication to both naturalistic objectivity and supernaturalism. Theistic evolution and the doctrine of scripture. We now begin a deeper discussion of theistic evolution's impact on historical Christian belief with an analysis of its relationship to the doctrine of scripture. According to Philip Johnson, piety and knowledge remain separate for many today because of the belief that different ways of thinking govern religion, uh, religious and secular topics, as exemplified by Stephen Jay Gould. Nonetheless, the evolutionary way of thinking is rooted in, in an unacknowledged creation story, a kind of materialist religion that Johnson describes as so in, in this way. In the beginning were the particles and the impersonal laws of physics, and the particles somehow became complex living stuff, and the stuff imagined God, but then discovered evolution. <laughs> Both supporters and opponents of evolutionary theory agree that validating evolution requires either the rejection or the ra radical reinterpretation of Christian scripture. This rare harmony may be examined on multiple grounds, of which we shall take up but one, namely the argument for descent with modification. The descent argument, 
which we shall shortly address, despite some attempt to link it with Genesis uh, 2.7, is still alien to Christian belief based on the Genesis account. Darwinian evolution and neo-Darwinism insist that a development of life on Earth has evol involved slow and gradual modification through descent and natural selection, rather than the common view of the immutability of species. Darwin's view exposes ignorance of the biblical teaching he feels constrained to challenge. Reference to the common view of the immutability of species addresses popular misunderstanding of the Bible's teaching on creation after their kind, not necessarily the Bible itself. Simply stated, and despite generations of evolutionist attacks, the Bible does not teach the fixity of species, yet the false accusation continues. But a second misconception, equally contrary to scripture, conceals itself within Darwin's dissent argument. The confusion emerges in his definition of superiority. The more recent forms must, on my theory, be higher than the more ancient. For each new species is formed by having had some advantage in the struggle for life over other and preceding forms. If under a nearly similar climate, the Eocene inhabitants of one quarter of the world were put into competition with the inhabitants of the same or other quarter, presumably the modern inhabitants, the Eocene fauna and flora would certainly be beaten and exterminated. As would a secondary fauna, I assume that means Mesozoic, by a uh, uh, Eocene, by an Eocene, or and a Paleozoic fauna by a secondary fauna. In other words, as life keeps going, it keeps getting better and better and better. And you know, that's an interesting thing because that's a testable hypothesis now that we have organisms that uh, come from the uh, Permian, for example, that actually live. Um, <coughs> The arrangement is, for Darwin, a sensible one because it produces more recent and victorious forms of life in comparison with the ancient and beaten forms. It is difficult to conceive of a clearer contradiction of the spirit of Jesus Christ and of Christianity. Darwin's predication of the superiority of successfully violent may seem attractive logic to a might is right mentality but it bears little resemblance to Christ himself. For Jesus, it is the gentle, not the violent, who shall inherit the earth. The world he created and the one which man will ultimately be restored, uh, to which one man will ultimately be restored, is one that evolution cannot comprehend, where the wolf shall dwell with the lamb and little children play with vipers. Theistic evolution departs from the Genesis record and displays a fundamental misunderstanding of the role and significance of the Bible when it argues for an objective human explanation of earth history as being compatible with the Genesis creation account. Thinking that does not give scripture priority is not automatic, authentically Christian, neither can it conceive of God's original world, nor are earth's most gifted scholars capable of explaining by naturalistic means what happened when God created heaven and earth. Theistic evolution is philosophically dislocated on both grounds. With regard to the second of these grounds, naturalistic explanation, theistic evolution supports a notion of autonomy in the created universe. The farce of research paradigms that investigate nature while explicitly excluding supernatural explanations may be compared to that of the infant in search of her parents, who determines a priori that they cannot, the real parents, cannot be considered during the investigation. And with regard to the first, a proper attitude to the primacy of scripture, Christian belief holds that the biblical record is the maker's own report on his product, necessary for ed the edification of mankind. Historical investigation has always given priority to inscriptions over other artifacts from antiquity. Graduate classes in archaeology taught me that discovering an inscription can guarantee an A grade. You find all the 
pots you want to. But if something says, made by so-and-so or made in such and such a place, you, uh, you have a far stronger argument that you've discovered something significant. Excavated rocks and bones, whatever their chemical and biological information, are still mute. The Bible is God's preserved and coherent inscription. It contains the unique record of his revelations in nature and in Jesus Christ. It testifies to being given by the divine guidance of the same God who made the world. Bart Ehrman, New Testament scholar and unbeliever, who gave up the faith of his youth because he, quote, could no longer reconcile the claims of faith with the facts of life, end quote, today offers his own stern criticism of early Christian faith. His thesis is that Christianity only became a unified whole after divergent thinkers had been stifled by the winners in a struggle of ideas. The New Testament is the victorious enemy in a struggle against the democratic fairness of diversity of theory, opinion, and position. As such, its witness is suspect, since you can never rely on the enemy's reports for a fair and disinterested presentation. Um, by the way, uh, Ehrman is not alone in that uh, kind of argument. The argument is something of an inversion of Darwin's theory on the superiority of the stronger. In other words, if Christianity really did arise that way, isn't the final result the more appropriate one, if you're a Darwinian? For Darwin, being successfully violent is being better. For Ehrman, Christianity's alleged success through triumph over weaker enemies makes it untrustworthy. Um, the claim, though not new, is awkward indeed, for it was the meek vulnerability of the Messiah and his followers before their opponents that led to his crucifixion and their martyrdom by the thousands in early Christian history. Their blood proved to be the seed of the church. Equally amazing, the sacred writings of God's holy book outlasted its enemies, so that, quote, there are no other surviving documents that are as reliable and as historically close to Jesus and the early days of the church as the writings included in the New Testament. Um, uh, fascinating to think about. Uh, Johannes uh, Geldenheis explains how this came to be so. The fact as such that Jesus possesses a f supreme divine authority, and again that's his ellipsis, gives us the assurance that the Lord of all authority would have seen uh, to it that an adequate and completely reliable account of his life and work was written and preserved for the ages to come. And by the way, if that's really true, uh, then our approach to uh, church policy should be one of, uh, of uh, being careful not to be destroying, but rather to be building. Um, if theistic evolution is to be seen as an authentic option for Christian belief, it must be sympathetic to the claims of scripture with regard to its supernaturally revealed truths, including its position on origins. Anything less is an illogical dichotomy. But it is this very supernaturalism that theistic evolution resists with its own humanly calculated story of origins. Contradictorily, theistic evolution allows the biblical creation narrative to sig signify certain scientifically non-demonstrable things about God. At the same time, despite the careful detail in its narration, Genesis is not allowed to signify how God created or how long creation took. If you believe in the virgin birth, then why are you stopping at uh, creation? Theistic evolution and the doctrine of God. Even without understanding the Trinitarian mystery that God of the Bible overwhelms theistic e evolution's haphazard little mechanistic deity, to whom, as Christopher Hitchens scathingly acknowledges, theistic evolution would offer its worship. Those who have yielded, this is Christopher Hitchens now, not without struggle, to the overwhelming evidence of evolution are now trying to award themselves a medal for their own acceptance of defeat. The very magnificence and variety of the process, they now wish to say, argues for directing an originating mind. In this way, they choose to make a fumbling fool of their pretended God. 
and make him out to be a tinkerer, an approximator, and a blunderer, who took eons of time to fashion a few serviceable figures and heaped up a jump, junkyard of scrap and failure meanwhile. Have they no more respect for the deity than that? By contrast with theistic evolution's bungling de death generator, scripture's omnipotent God guarantees life without need for either tools or raw material. Even his use of creation's one week proves that his creative power depend no more on time than it does on matter or accident. He surely has no need for death in order to bring life into being. He does not need anything. He himself gives all life and breath and everything, as Acts 17.25 says. The Exodus story provides an out outstanding example of the miraculous power of the sovereign God's first scene at creation. Commissioned to confront Pharaoh and free God's people, Moses is endowed with miracle working power. When you go back to Egypt, the Lord instructs, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders, Mophitim in the Hebrew, which I have put in your power. Assuring him of the divine omnipotence, the Lord illustrates his power and transcendence. What is that in your hand? God asked. A staff, answers Moses. Then he said, Wayomer, which is the same word in, uh, as in, uh, and God said in the Genesis, throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground and it became, Wayehi, a serpent. Same word as in, and there was light. Uh, the grammatical and syntactical elements of this miracle story appear together only three times in the Old Testament. First is the creation story, uh, Genesis 1, 3, and 6, and so on, with its obtrusive verbal root, say, command, amar, and be, become, haya, as God speaks and matter and life come to exist. The exegetical value of comparing Exodus 4, 20, uh, 2, and 3, and Genesis 1, 3, and following, lies in the rarity of these verbal combinations in the Hebrew Bible. Through their roots, Amar and Haya, and forms, Wayomer and Wayehi. Uh, though their roots are ubiquitous in the Old Testament, and that should be in note 33, in no passage besides these three in the Hebrew Bible, the third being Psalm 33, are they presented in this narrative relationship. It is scarcely coincidental that all three passages report the same activity as stated by the psalmist. He spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. Or as he notes elsewhere uh, in the next paragraph, he said, and it was. To understand that God put, uh, brought the world into existence simply by speaking, gives both the facts about matter's origins and the off awesome truth about the originator of matter. Today, science can no more fathom this God, nor account for the wonders of flora and fauna he speaks into instantaneous existence than could the magic arts of Pharaoh's courtiers forced to exclaim before Moses' miracles, this is the finger of God. If theistic evolution is actually Christian, it must be a new Christianity because no such God as it proposes the creation of the latest scientific consensus was part of historic Christianity. Theistic evolution's downgrading of the God revealed in scriptures is the only, only half addressed until we are confronted by God's self-characterization. For above and beyond his power to create and sustain suns and planets by his word and to predict the end from the beginning, it is the incomparable greatness of his love by which he asked to define him. God is love is the fundamental and immutable Judeo-Christian <coughs> definition of the God who creates and sustains. Inconceivable in the context of the perpetual violence that pervades theistic evolution. And then he discusses the excluded enemy, theistic evolution's missing link. We have seen that although theistic evolution declares its commitment to science, it vigorously proclaims the message of scripture that nature is God's lesson book. Affirming both evolution and scripture, Dembski's chirological reading of Genesis 1 to 3 does double duty as validation of the long ages of coming into being and of the Sabbath of creation. Uh, it, the day, if the days of creation are chirological, referring to basic divisions in the divine order of creation, 
Then Sabbath observance reflects a fundamental truth about the creation of the world. Sabbath observance enables us who are made in the image of God to understand the proper place of human work in the light of God's work. And we're skipping down quite a ways. Understanding the fall ceases to matter when consequences precede their origin. Uh, this is a special, uh, especially aimed at uh, Bill Dembski, who uh, says that the time doesn't matter. The effects of the fall can be retroactive, that would be Dembski. Clarifying Dembski's understanding of the fall does nothing to improve his reasoning, since it involves a God testing creaturely loyalty in some perfect place, the Garden of Eden, a segregated area that gives no evidence of natural evil. Theistic evolution's search for moral justification thus brings us back to the place where we started, the Bible's testimony about the original physical environment, namely a perfect creation. Theistic evolution's recognition of the logical need for testing loyalty in a perfect place results in its distorted alternative to the biblical revelation. It's rather jarring to try to put those two together. Theistic evolution's con confusion arises from its absolute faith in human objectivity and its attribution of all supernatural activity to one unique supernatural agent, while overlooking the strong biblical witness to the existence of a malevolent supernatural agent in the person of Satan, and it might add malevolent people as well. His operations involve considerable deception, including anonymity, misplaced blame, as he notes in Job 1, and imposture, speaking of himself in terms belonging to God. The sine qua non for any biblically based th Christian theodicy is full recognition of the existence of Satan as the avowed enemy of God and all that is good to the, and to the biblical evidence of his nature and intentions. Such recognition distinguishes his instigation and, pre uh, and perpetration of evil from God's gracious activity while granting to the sovereign Lord all the right to administer judgment and justice in the universe. The Bible's real and personal Satan is theistic evolutions and Darwin's missing link that has led to generations of frustration about the origin of evil and the illogical and demonic misattribution of that evil to God as its source. Evolution in any form, including theistic evolution, has no logical place for such a Satan or cosmic conflict between him and Christ and a final eschatological triumph that restores the universe to its original perfection. And uh, following on from this, uh, theistic evolution's exclusion of Satan, now what do you do with sin? Theistic evolution is still evolution even though dressed as in a different garb and the evolutionary and biblical paradigms consistently run contrary to each other. The biblical teaching of a perfect being, tragic fall and ulti ultimate restoration through redemption in Christ contrasts directly and thoroughly with theistic evolution's concept of a 14 billion year old explosion progressively yielding higher and higher forms of life, climaxing with human species derived through an ape-like ancestry. The need for that savior and the atonement he provides are no less baffling than theistic evolution's belief in sin. How, may we ask, in the constant progress towards the better does the need for a savior arise? Theistic evolution speculation that God influenced selected animals within the evolutionary process towards self-conscious intelligence and obedience to his will is a sad attempt to moralize an essentially brutal theory. Theistic evolution knows of no original bliss to which we may return. Theistic evolution's philosophizing cannot change the biblical truth that death is a curse. The triumphant climax of Revelation 21 and 22 that completes history cycle remains inaccessible to theistic evolution for it cannot logically aspire to a restoration of paradise while denying the original paradise. Theistic evolution and salvation is a new creation. Among other things, theistic evolution claims that creation is a secondary doctrine for Christians. Such a notion would be entirely incomprehensible to New Testament Christians for its heretical claim constitutes a direct account attack on the Christian doctrine of salvation. The Christ of early Christianity derives his redemptive credentials precisely from his authority as the eternal creator God. One of the crucial New Testament declarations on this relationship is Colossians 
1, 13 through 22, where the doctrine of Christ as creator is pointedly stated, basically sandwiched, between two equally clear affirmations of his redemptive work of reconciliation. And there are the texts, notice that we have redemption through his blood, and then we have the all things created by him, and then again, reconcile all things to himself. The church father Athanasius, repeatedly banished for his defense of Christ's full deity, explains to his young convert Macarius, the renewal of creation has been wrought by the selfsame word who made it in the beginning. There is thus no inconsistency between creation and salvation. Thoughtful readers might conclude that theistic evolution's impact on the basic Christian doctrines of sin and salvation are among its most per pernicious consequences. Um, talking about Adventist theology, theistic evolution's interpretations of scriptures hold significant implications for Adventist theology going to the very core of our name and identity. Collins well expresses the true nature of the issue and the root of th uh, theistic evolution's dilemma when he acknowledged when I became a believer at 27, I couldn't take Genesis literally because I had come to the scientific worldview before I came to the spiritual worldview. Again, the ellipses in the quote are, are uh, uh, Dr. Caesar's. Collins would be no authority on genetics if he were that dismissive of its principal texts. He and theistic evolution are entirely correct in believing that nature and God, properly understood, cannot contradict each other. Where they have seriously gone astray is in understanding the relationship to each other of God's two books of nature and scripture. Theistic evolutionary thought has distorted that balance, giving primacy to the one that should be given to the other, and therefore effectively giving erring human beings veto power over God's revelation in scripture and in Jesus. The urgent cry of the first of Revelation 14's three angels, heard around the world since the mid-19th century, and thus broadly corresponding in time with the appearance of Darwinian thought, responds to evolutionary claims by reiterating the statements of Scripture's opening declaration. That is, of course, fear God and give glory to him and worship him, who made heaven and earth and the sea. But what of Adventist identity and Adventist theology? Quite evidently, they cannot be reasonably or exegetically reconciled with theistic evolutionary thought. Adventism that will be faithful to its prophetic calling must resist the unbiblical and essentially humanistic assertions of theistic evolution. It must, with charity and due recognition of views sincerely held, expose theistic evolution's confused theology by declaring the light of the everlasting gospel of Revelation 14.6, rooted as it clearly is in the Genesis creation account and reflecting biblical theology as a whole. We do this by honest exegesis, proclamation, and worshiping the creator God according to his explicit requirement. In conclusion, and these are the six points of Collins' uh, uh, commentary that we saw earlier brought back in next because he's going to be discussing these six statements so that you can remember them. The first of Collins' six statements with which we began demands a response from the Christian believer because evolutionary time continues unbroken from the Big Bang to at least 850 million years of life on this planet. Through the Bible, or pardon me, though the Bible does not speak specifically to the age of the universe, it points to life on Earth as being only a few thousand years old. Colin's second statement would enjoy wide agreement and draw enthusiastic support from Christian believers who find it no surprise that the universe recommends itself as organized for life. The testimony of Scripture is that God formed the Earth to be inhabited. It was planned that way. And the Genesis creation account makes it abundantly clear that the purpose for creating the earth in specific relation to other cosmic bodies was to sustain life. And then he'll discuss the third, fourth, and fifth one. Statements three to five, however, can only be understood and accepted in context of the evolutionary presuppositions that guide Collins' thinking and the thinking of like-minded theistic evolutionists. For theistic evolutionists, evolution's proponents, science is the only legitimate way to investigate the natural world. Their study within that frame of interpretation leads to the conviction that life on Earth can only be explained in terms of long, slow, 
graduated processes leading from simple to complex forms. Evolution as a mechanism can be and must be true. But as we have seen in this and other chapters in this book, it is impossible to reconcile this view with any consistent reading of scripture. And then finally, Collins' sixth statement is admirably optimistic, but flawed and suspect on two grounds. His belief in a universal consciousness of moral law and a universal longing for God are both seriously open to question as the effects of evolutionary thinking shape the consciousness of successive generations worldwide and permeate society at all levels. After two centuries of false evolutionary optimism, we may justifiably ask, where is the better society promised, even required by evolution? Although I happen to think that the argument is still good, it just points to the flaw in trying to make this a totally naturalistic story. Um, Collins' optimism for universal human consciousness of moral law and universal longing for God do not seem at all well founded in today's world. His conviction is the other side of J.L. Mackey's coin in which evil is only problematic for someone who believes there is a, good, a God who is both omnipotent and wholly good. In short, theistic evolution's evolutionary based theology is clearly built on shift, shift, shifting sand rather than on the sure foundation of God's word. Meanwhile, Bible-based Christianity, historical Christian belief, and Adventist theology alike must be constantly alert to living and proclaiming every word that has come by divine revelation. Believers must beware lest they be taken captive by persuasive but misconceived philosophy according to the traditions of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ, which Incidentally, is the only place where the Greek word philosophia appears in the New Testament. Uh, the Christian will not, be avoid, will not avoid or evade the scandal of the cross or naive belief in Satan and a cosmic controversy. The condemnation of theistic evolution is that it is but one more shrewd attempt to distort revelation by human logic. In some minds, it may represent a step beyond other major Christian heresies. The docetism and Arianism of the church's past constituted failures to take hold properly of the challenging biblical revelation concerning Christ with which theologians grappled. These heresies, those heresies were failures in an intellectual struggle with the revelation which so-called human logic prevailed over revelation itself. By contrast, theistic evolution depends upon materialistic presuppositions by which scripture is to be interpreted and to which Christians are then required to subscribe. Theistic evolution affects all that we know by special revelation from creation to redemption and recreation, with distorting effects reaching back beyond the Garden of Eden to satanic rebellion against the Creator. We close by referring to one more study on the theological and exegetical problems posed by theistic evolution. In his book, Did God Use Evolution?, Dr. Werner Gitt, uh, that's actually Werner Gitt, uh, points out points out 10 dangers inherent in theistic evolution and uh, examines in detail 20 objections to the theory concluding there is an unbridgeable chasm between theistic evolution and the biblical doctrine of creation and stating proponents of theistic evolution relegate the Bible to a subordinate role. In the final chapter, Consequences of Theistic Evolution, Dr. Gitt reminds <coughs> us that Theistic evolution undermines the traditional way in which the Bible has been understood by Christians for centuries and warns adherence to the views of theistic evolution leads to the abandonment of central biblical teachings. We have attempted to show the accuracy of this statement in some detail in this chapter. For all who regard the Bible as God's revealed word, it is perhaps the most serious theological challenge of our time. Now, I think Dr. Caesar makes some very po uh, good points. Uh, the book has this plan, the, the defense of the scriptural theory of Genesis, and it starts out with the theological defense and then goes into intelligent design, cosmology, the limits of evolution, critiques of evolutionary theory, and uh, the flood, and then talks about evolutionary ethics, and then finally, can we make some kind of a compromise? And Dr. Caesar, of course, is arguing no. I think the chapter is a very good chapter. It points out the incompatibility of theistic evolution with both historical Christian belief and with traditional Adventist theology. I think if you start from a biblical basis, the argument is really quite persuasive. 
The argument, of course, is incomplete, and the obvious rejoinder is, well, why do you give the Bible such a privileged status? And uh, one can argue that this consideration shouldn't influence a Christian, who, after all, is believing in uh, Christ and therefore in the Bible that Christ believed in. But one has to say it often does. I think a more comprehensive discussion would acknowledge that theistic evolution represents a bowing to perceived empirical evidence. That's, in fact, the genesis of theistic evolution. Life on Earth appears, in, at least in their opinion, to be old. There is good evidence for God, in their opinion, and I think there really is good evidence from science itself. Science discovers God. Um, and Jesus is an attractive figure in that case. Uh, and it's not clear exactly how you handle miracles. Miracles figure in there somewhere, um, but miracles, of course, are not um, uh, acceptable to the standard uh, uh, scientific interpretation. I think that uh, Dr. Caesar has addressed uh, the more restricted question, and I, that's probably by design. And I'm, uh, by itself, I don't think that design is bad. I think that we need to mention two other truths somewhere in there, uh, some of which has been addressed by uh, Dr. Roth's chapter, uh, and some of which is, uh, was address, direct, addressed by uh, uh, Tim Standish's chapter. The evolutionary myth is not, in fact, self-consistent. That is, it doesn't have the whole answer. And that means that the faith that m many people put in what they consider to be science is in fact misplaced. And the second one is that the age question for life on Earth is in fact more scientifically defensible from a short age perspective than it is commonly thought. Um, I do think that, it's, that this is a very nice chapter and it's kind of a Joshua moment. Who, who are you going to believe? Who are you going to serve? Uh, whether the gods that uh, you came from or the gods that live here but as for me and myself, we will serve the Lord. And if we serve the biblical God, I think that it's, there's no question that uh, theistic evolution just won't quite fill the bill. But that's my opinion. And now it's time to allow you guys to speak. Now, for the record, uh, it is now 11.30, and I know that some of you need to go elsewhere. And I apologize for not allowing you to have your say. but. Uh, uh, for the rest of you, uh, we will uh, continue the discussion here. Um, <coughs> hand it back if you need to. The, this is a nice chapter, but it doesn't seem to really address the, the, the paradoxical emergence of theistic evolution in our own ranks. Uh, and it, it's almost in a different mutated form uh, and the, the the mutated form is a, a greater admixture of theology wherever it suits the evolutionary thinking uh, as well as evolution um, the arguments that i've been faced by fellow adventists for example would be well since for god one day is as good as a thousand years and a thousand years is as good as one day. When we know that God can do anything, he could have done it by evolution too, and how can you exclude that as a possibility? Um, and as I, as, when I was first confronted by this line of reasoning, I was almost baffled that somebody would actually venture into such a line of thinking far less somebody Adventist actually proposed such a line of thinking. Um, uh, but the more I thought of, I mean, it took me something like six months to just ponder on this imponderability to, to come to grips with what's really going on here. And, and ultimately, I concluded that these <coughs> individuals that come up with this kind of thinking essentially are trying to present 
the idea that evolution can somehow accomplish something uniquely optimal that God in his omniscience and omnipotence in no other way could achieve. And when I realized this contained, implicitly contained concept, it, it simply occurred to me that that meant that we have essentially raised evolutionary thinking to the point of the divine. And it struck me, now why would we as Adventists go to such heroic efforts to salvage a thinking that is at odds with the very idea of God. Well, as, as Caesar pointed out, it's not just that um, we're we are elevating evolution to the status of God. Um, when we do that, we are also elevating struggle to the status of God. And then it makes it really hard to kind of suddenly reverse course and say that we uh, think that Adventists shouldn't uh, be active participants uh, in killing other people, let's say, in wartime. Uh, it, it makes a total disconnect if you're, if you're saying that, uh, that we have a duty to be kind to other people. Why? Because, you know, if, if evolutionary, uh, evolutionarily speaking, they should be left behind, uh, you know, why are we uh, trying to preserve those people? Preserve, preserving failures, essentially. Uh, preserve the inferior, preserve that which will cause the death of our civilization. Um, and um, the, the, the spirit is just wrong. You know, either we believe in the God who says that the meek shall inherit the earth, or we believe that the strong shall inherit the earth. And the, you know, the, the people who are willing to push their, their way around. You know, Jesus talked about the, the, the people who run the show and the Gentiles, lord it over them. They express domination, you know. But with you it shall not be so, that he who is great among you must be your servant, and he who is um, your chief has got to be uh, your slave. <clears throat> and as the supreme example of that, the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life. Now, if that's what Christianity is all about, then you can't fit that in with, well, how we got here was actually by dog eat dog, by the survival of the fittest by nature, red and tooth and claw. All right. I appreciate the chapter very much and the approach he took. I simply want to remind us that uh, if you adopt, say, an evolutionary viewpoint, as, uh, especially Collins does, and, um, or Dembski, uh, you're, you're running into scientific problems there also that uh, I think impinge upon the, this question of, of theistic evolution. Uh, for instance, uh, how could complexity develop if, uh, for instance, Colin says, you know, well, God interfered when, when man's soul was created. Uh, 
But uh, evolution proceeded by itself. Uh, I mean, this is so mathematically improbable. Uh, Not only is it mathematically improbable, but it's physically undemonstrable. Uh, and uh, uh, Lenski's uh, illustration uh, with how E. coli has evolved uh, gives a classic example of that. It, uh, yeah, well, uh, and it, uh, I, I think um, uh, Dembski has you know, shown how it's virtually impossible that, that advanced organisms could have evolved in the long geological ages uh, in his framework and in his, uh, I believe, his third chapter in his book. He goes into that in quite, quite a few details about this. Uh, so that uh, the, the, the structure doesn't hold up uh, in terms of uh, the model that is proposed. Uh, and I would add to that that the second thing is the, uh, the time issue. Uh, while the majority of the uh, scientific literature unquestionably endorses long geologic ages, there are certain factors that, that challenge it, and, and you, you know a little bit about this, for instance, uh, residual carbon-14 being one, and uh, peregrine forties being another, rates of erosion being another. Uh, Soft sediment deformation being a huge one. Yes, well, uh, <laughs> uh, in Kodachrome Basin, for instance, <laughs> I don't know if you've been there or not, but... Uh, I'm also thinking of some of the, you know, where where layers come in six million years later and then the lower layer kind of allows pillows to <laughs> go down and oozes up in between the cracks. And yes, well, we, uh, th this is, uh, uh, maybe you're thinking about um, Capitol Reef, those pillows, uh, where we got 10 million years uh, difference there and it looks like so we have some uh, uh, ball and pillow uh, features there. Uh, so, you know, you've got this aspect also that uh, uh, theistic evolution needs to answer and that is, hey, hey, uh, uh, your science is not holding up together that well. Uh, uh, and uh, we, uh, we have a right to, to wonder if uh, you should not be a little more inclusive of uh, uh, divine intervention and so on to answer these hard scientific questions. Uh, we have some more hands here. I, I agree, and that's why at the end you'll notice that I summarized that I think that, uh, that his approach needs to have, not necessarily by him, he may not be the most qualified to do that. Uh, you know, his Hebrew is probably a bit better than his, uh, than his geology. You know, but but it is something that needs to be said that there are actually problems that that um, that you can point out uh, with the standard model uh, that are not eas that are not easily solved uh, and that are much more easily solved by short age. Uh, while we're at it, the 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 fact that uh, you know apparently uh, peptides and uh, Maybe even the basic structure of protein has survived in uh, dinosaurs and, and uh, you know living creatures for two hundred and fifty million years. Yeah, there's spores, but still. <laughs> I've been uh, dialoguing, uh, discussing about this with uh, some members of. I mean, people who uh, do not believe the Bible, and they uh, believe in God. They, you know, essentially this type of individuals. And uh, so I said, uh, "How do you explain the fact that Jesus, the Son of God, did believe in a literal flood?" Oh, he said, "Well, he lived in an age of ignorance. He could not have." You know, he just accepted what people, ignorant people in those times, uh, uh, believe in those myths. So I said, well, if that's the case, if Jesus cannot be trusted, 
about the past, why should I trust him about the future? Because he promised eternal life, he promised a second coming, an instant resurrection, not of just the, in the creation of Adam and Eve, one couple, but millions of people resurrected instantly. So, if I, if I cannot trust Jesus about the past, why should I trust him about what he said about the future? Well, he, he didn't have an answer about this, but went into long ages. And of course, I'm not an expert in long ages, so I had to resort to Ariel Roth and you and other individuals. But uh, long ages it seems to be the problem for Adventists who resort to choose uh, theistic evolutions. It's the problem for Christians who resort to, long, uh, to theistic evolution. Um, Bill Dembski has, uh, is on record as saying if he could believe in short ages, he'd believe in creation in a heartbeat. Um, I think that that's probably true for C.S. Lewis as well. It's fascinating, you know, he never really says anything about evolution. What little he does say kind of accepts it as a background. Um, but when he does his Narnia Chronicles, it's creation all the way. And I think there are a lot of people that are that way, that their heart is with creation, their head is with evolution because they don't see what to do about the long ages. And the long ages and the, the scientific evidence that's used to support long ages is really the 800 pound girl in the room. And I don't think we do anybody a good service by ignoring that. I think we need to, hit, we need to confront it head on. If, if if it's really the problem that we have, then we need, to, we need to say so right up front. And then I think we need to spend what scientific time we have looking at that exact question. And uh, Ariel Roth and I both will, can say that, uh, that if you do so fairly, it isn't, uh, the 800 pound gorilla isn't as strong as he's made out to be. It gets smaller and smaller. <laughs> Um, I have this question, if, if a person incorporates an old earth into his theology, will he always be a the theistic evolutionist? I don't know whether that is a, a um, stable position or not. In other words, will he, after 50 years, finally surrender one way or the other? No, no, no. I'm saying if he takes that position, if he takes a position in theology that incorporates, um, that incorporates an old earth, will he always be branded as a theistic evolutionist. Well, I mean, if you're asking it that way, there will always be those who brand him as a theistic evolutionist. Um, but so, by the definition, so yes, would it be? Yes, in a way. If you're asking, is it fair to consider him as a theistic evolutionist, um, that depends on how you define theistic evolution. I've already brought out that there are at least two definitions. There's the old one that said, well, God did it, just took a long time, and you know, here and there, and then the rest of it was natural development. Um, and then there's the new one that doesn't have any, any divine intervention whatsoever, and just has things developing from the origin of life, which they have no explanation for, straight on out to, uh, uh, to what we have today with no, no divine activity whatsoever. Uh, and um, there is a third one, which is old earth creationism, which says that nothing ever got outside of the, uh, they will usually agree with new, uh, young age creationists in that um, you're not talking about a, uh, you know, going from, let's say, deer to whales, let alone going from, uh, uh, 
let's say, amoeba to uh, monkeys. We're talking about uh, God creating each individual kind, which is usually you know, felt to be somewhere close to the family level, which is very much what I would say and what I think most young Earth creationists would say, that uh, when Linnaeus tried to make it the species, uh, he drew the species uh, re, um, boundary too, too fine, and that, for example, horses and zebras belong in the same species. And Linnaeus, by the way, later on recognized that in his own uh, work. And I think, for example, the, the difference between polar bears and, uh, let's say, Alaskan brown bears, uh, the two can interbreed. You know, they're not really different species in the, in the strict sense. Um, and uh, and that, that's pretty much standard uh, creationist belief. Uh, and there are old earth creationists who maintain that God had to create every single different basic family type. And humans were one of the basic family types that God had to create that we didn't come from monkeys or apes or chimpanzees or anything like that. But you know, you're you're justifying old to, um, to fix a problem, and that is to make sure that a species can get from one point to another. What if, what if a person actually had a theology that came, that formed an old earth outlook, instead of, instead of fixing those problems? Like we do in a way, we're Adventists, because we believe in the war in heaven, we believe that things happened before creation and that things needed to be fixed even before created, creation started. So there is kind of an old, old time there. It may not be an old earth, but... Um, um, well, there's an, uh, there's an old age... There, there's an old age of the earth with a young age of life on earth is, is one of the positions that can be taken. It's when you start making old life that you start getting into the problems. And it's common to whatever you want to call them, the old theistic evolutionists, the people who have God intervening at certain points to kind of help the process along, uh, the the old earth flat out creationists, people like you, Ross, for example. Um, I mean, there's a, there are people who hold that position and who have websites and publications and whatever, you know, that make their arguments. And, and there are also the theistic evolutionists of the new variety, which say God set the evolutionary process and, uh, and going in and backed off and let it run. Uh, that's people like Ken Miller. It's Kenneth. No, I, 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 it was a K. I just couldn't remember which one. Um, and, um, uh, you know, uh, Francis Collins fits into that category. Um, the point is that it's not what you get labeled at as that counts. The real question is, what do you do to explain certain kinds of, of data? And what do you do with the concepts? And one of the things that you can do is you can explain everything on the basis of an old a earth and then God freshly creating stuff. You can explain things in an old earth and God doing a little genetic manipulation if you like. You can explain things on the basis of an old earth and God putting in a process so good that it could take amoebas and take it all the way up. You can explain even uh, a process where God creates the process so good that all he has to do is to start things, everything very, being very perfectly balanced, and then allow uh, life to originate on its own. Now, you don't have a lot of scientific evidence for that, but that's one way of handling the data. If you do that, 
If you do any one of those things, there are certain theological uh, consequences that you have to live with. And one of those theological consequences is that you basically cut yourself off from historical Christian belief, uh, uh, or certain aspects of historical Christian belief. Tradi uh, traditions, if you want to call them that, yeah. But uh, they're, they're based on uh, you know, stories that came out of the Bible. Period. I mean, you cannot blend those two together because you have to have a fall for a redeemer. The, if, if Jesus is the Messiah, the anointed one, what was he anointed for? Right? And if Jesus, uh, if he was anointed to save his people from their sins, then they're sinning somehow. There's a problem that he's trying to solve. And, and if his mission is is to restore, restore paradise, then you have to have paradise to begin with. Otherwise, you can't restore it. That's just simply the concepts that you have to deal with. And one of the problems with theistic evolution is that it makes it really difficult, in my opinion, impossible, but you know, I'm open to somebody arguing, uh, to be able to deal with that problem. And so it's not a matter of whose label you've got. And they can call themselves, you know, theistic evolutionists, progressive creationists. I want to know what they believe and how they fit it in with standard Christian belief, uh, for that matter, with Adventist belief. Uh, and I really don't care what the name is, except that the name is a handy you know, for me, it's kind of like using X in a variable, you know? You can use Y, you can use C, you know, as long as we both understand that this X does these things. The name is not as important as the reality behind it. Names can bring on fallacies, though. What? Names can bring on fallacies. Like uh, uh, they can, well, if you misname something, you can assume that it has properties that it doesn't. If you call something e to the x and it doesn't behave in an exponential fashion, um, you're throwing people for a loop. I, I think that's bad. Well, I mean like guilt by association. <laughs> well, the question is, are the properties that we're talking about ones that are associated with the properties of the other group. If not, then I agree that that's false guilt by association. If they are, then it's guilt by association because it's actually true. <laughs> uh, go ahead and then we'll come back to you. I noticed on the you, you had this this argument of dog eat dog versus uh, the meek shall inherit the earth, and it, it seems interesting to me that these were the only the, the only options considered. That this question was bifurcated without any consideration of other possibilities. There's a possibility that both of them are wrong. Um. Of course, there is a possibility of both of them being wrong or both of them being half right. Both of them can't be fully true at the same time. True. Um, uh, but in order to make that case, I think that uh, it's important to be able to give an example of something that's n neither of the two or perhaps a combination of the two to compare. And then at that point, uh, uh, at that point we can discuss whether it uh, makes sense or not. Well, the, for example, there, there is evolutionary evidence that altruism has a evolutionary basis in that groups of individuals came together and, and were willing to sacrifice their own lives to save the group. And if you look at, at survival, 
the strong doesn't necessarily survive all the time. It's and and if you look at actually the actual ev teaching of evolution says that the survivors will inherit the earth. It makes the assumption that the strong are going to be their survivors, but that isn't necessarily the case. Well, I, I we have somebody who is wanting to answer that question or at least to discuss it. I, I just might amplify a little bit on this altruism thing. Uh, the leading icon of uh, altruism has been for some 40 years uh, E.O. Wilson at Harvard and uh, he in the last uh, four or five years ago he completely repudiated that argument that you know kin selection uh, is how uh, is, is the factor that uh, is the machinery behind the evolutionary support for altruism uh, True, others are not giving up that idea as fast because they, they you know, old ideas uh, don't disappear instantly. Uh, but uh, there are some factors, well, like like meerkats. I don't know if you know. Uh, you see them in. Uh, well, they got some here in the museum desert, desert museum here in uh, near Palm Springs, for instance, where uh, these animals are the most altruistic that we know of. But they do it regardless of kin selection. Kin selection does not, I mean, the social group is such that uh, intruders come in all the time. And they, they are altruistic. And this kind of destroys the evolutionary uh, model that they, uh, it's not kin selection. It's not kin selection. Uh, because, uh, uh, and so. Uh, selection is incidental, it's not incidental. What's that? Kim selection is incidental, it's not an error. Yeah, and, and, and it's, uh, well, uh, it's supposed to be the, the evolutionary mechanism for it. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, and furthermore, it's so limited uh, in its mathematical construct, you know, if you, uh, if you can save perhaps nine of your relatives, maybe you'll have some kin selection. But what, what about this much broader uh, picture of, of uh, uh, populations? Uh, it's not going to work there. It's not going to work there. So uh, uh, there's serious problems with kin selection, uh, but you know the concept is not dead. The, the one thing to keep in mind is that if God created animals, plants, people, originally altruistic, it may take a while before that uh, gets lost in a naturalistic scenario. And it may even be that God decides that uh, he wants that to continue and so therefore preserve certain of those uh, animals for whatever reason he has. From an evolutionary perspective, it's not clear why that, why that should develop in the first place or why once it developed, it would stay there. And I know that you know, there's the argument that, that for example, meerkats should... Uh, 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 have some kind of evolutionary advantage because they have this altruistic idea. But one of the things you have to keep in mind is this. Saying that is simply saying that meerkats exist and because we know evolution is true they must have come through evolution. And therefore there must be some evolutionary advantage. And the fact of the matter is that that's totally theory dependent. It doesn't have any, uh, any un until you can show why that particular behavior makes meerkats uh, survive better, <coughs> you haven't really answered the question. And in fact, you, you're going to have to show why that behavior should make the meerkats who are more <laughs> altruistic survive better than the meerkats that didn't behave that way who are otherwise identical. Because presumably at one time meerkats were like all other animals in which case they were kind of selfish too. Now why did they suddenly decide to get, why did a population of half meerkats, why didn't the cheaters win more often? The, the ones who let everybody else warn them 
but who never gave warnings themselves, so they never exposed themselves to danger. Why didn't they take over the colony? And it's not clear why that should happen on an evolutionary basis. I think it is clear. Uh, Meerkats. Go ahead. Yeah. The, the problem with meerkats uh, is that you have, in, the, in their colonies, which are, you know, uh, sometimes a dozen, two dozen uh, of these animals in their colonies, uh, there's usually one dominant uh, couple or so on that kind of run the colony. But mixed in with these are visitors that are genetically unrelated to the group that is there. They're living together there. They will go out and be sentinels and protect those to whom they are not genetically related, which challenges kin, kin selection. Well, meerkats tend to live in family groups. And although um, yeah, but it's those outside, that are outside individuals mm -hmm. can come into the group, the group uh, is still predominantly that family. And as, as the group gets larger, it'll break up into more family groups. If you have one group of meerkats that was, say, originally one group was altruistic and the next group was not, and the mm -hmm. altruistic group tended to survive better and multiply more, even if individuals mm -hmm. came in from outside, they would, they would interbreed with those that had the, the gene that made them altruistic. But why and would the, and the okay. the ones that the that the cat warns, most mm. of them are his relatives and carry the same gene. Why would the behavior to join other groups evolve when you, you see that poses the problem there? That's uh, that spreads that, uh, genetic okay. alleles. That, um, a, gen a, ge a genetic allele that arises in one group and then mm. an individual it, it, leaves uh, that group and it spreads that allele to another group. Yeah, th this could be and the strongest alleles or the most mm. survivable alleles survive. Uh, th this is possible, you know, and so on, but you have to raise the question why in the world will they do this if evolution is really the power behind it. Uh, Wilson has rejected uh, uh, kin selection, you know, and uh, he feels, well, it's probably just a, an accident uh, that happened. Uh, he deals more with bees and others, and, and uh, that, uh, well, uh, maybe there's some pre-adaptation and accident, but uh, he feels the thing, well, it's, it's too restricted to work. For, for these large colonies and so on. And that's, that's his, uh, and I'm sure he would not have given it up if he hadn't uh, seen some real problems there. I'm, I'm not familiar with Wilson. It, it sounds like this is a subject that uh, might be worth coming back to at another session. Um, Steve here has some comments I think that uh, be worthwhile. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on you know, kind of what Gary said, when we talk about the anthropic principle, we talk about a strong anthropic principle, weak anthropic principle, it declared down to the completely ridiculous anthropic principle, which is referred to as crap. C-R-A-P, yes. 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 Uh -huh. and, and, uh, so uh, part of the problem in here is we're talking about strong theistic evolution. You know, Francis Collins is probably at the top end of that. And, and, you know, well, I'd say Kenneth Miller is even further along. Okay. Than, but but yeah. yeah, they're they're close. Yeah, but but there's many uh, as discussed. You know, why would would Adventists cling on to this strong and uh, strong a uh, strong version of, of theistic evolution? Uh, I don't think they they are. They're they're concerned about. Uh, issues that uh, that require an addressing maybe a weak version of theistic evolution, and that's what it has not been defined here in this discussion. Um, and I think that's that's probably would be good, to, you know, this discussion uh, some uh, at some other time because you know we still have the issue of a long age uh, old universe, 
And if there's an old universe, that means there's a history of the Earth beyond 6,000 years ago that somehow has to, you know, really should be addressed, especially in a universe in which life existed. Because, you know, we're, we know that, that uh, you know, we believe as, as a church that other worlds are populated. That means life exists in the universe. So what was the Earth, how was the Earth connected to that prior to 6,000 years ago? We don't know. But that demands some kind of weak uh, uh, theistic evolution discussion. And, 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 uh, um, now, uh, you're, you're, you're not saying it demands some kind of weak theistic evolution. No. You're saying no. it dis demands a discussion yeah, but, of the... But, of the, you know, uh, and there's, there's other issues like in um, uh, Romans 8, 20, 22, it says, For the creation was subject to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. Uh, and the hope they'll be brought into the glorious freedom uh, of, of God. That there suggests frustration coming from God, how that, you know, in, in, in a sense, again, drives one to, to, we really need to consider some kind of uh, uh, weak version of theistic evolution and, uh, and to address those kind of questions. So that's just all I wanted to say. Uh, well, I, I will say a couple of things. One of them is that, uh, the Adventists that I know kind of, um, I mean, there are, of course, creationists who are quite happy with, uh, with the standard creationism, and, and uh, you know, we have a good number of them here, including myself. But there are also uh, a number of Adventists who um, fall into the, the category of believing in long ages. And one of the things that struck me as very, very odd was that when we invited people like um, uh, Phil Johnson to make a presentation. Now, Phil Johnson, if you tried to pin him down, he's really evasive about the age of the earth. But he will say things that let you think that, and in fact, that kind of leads you to believe that on balance, if he had to put his money down, he'd put his money on long ages. In theory, that should be someone around whom Adventists could rally around. Those of us who see you know, God intervening, Phil Johnson very strong, God intervening. Those of us uh, who, who maybe are uh, what you were calling a weak form, I think it was, of, uh, of theistic evolution, or, you know, evolution with strong progressive creationist tendencies. Uh, you would think that those people would say, oh, good, you know, well, we can finally get the, uh, the, uh, the age question off, and we can all agree that at least uh, you know God was strongly involved, and here's somebody who has some good evidence for it. In fact, uh, there were a number of people who were pretty strongly arguing against having Philip Johnson come here, and there were, and when the time came for a meeting, uh, one of my colleagues on that side uh, took a very strong anti-Johnson. Uh, stance and argued that uh, he had the scientific data all uh, kind of crazy. And so I'm not sure that the weak theory is as popular mm -hmm. as, you're, as you're sounding like you, you see it as being. Um, now, that's not to say that it doesn't deserve consideration. But I'm just pointing out that the reality is that a lot of people who uh, it's tempting to say, well, they're just, they just want a little room on the age issue and that's it. In fact, there's quite a bit more going on than that. Uh, but the other thing is that the age issue makes uh, it difficult to create a Garden of Eden with no, uh, no evidence of the struggle that's left. Um, it makes it difficult to have, uh, 
to have a God who uh, is kind to his created creatures when he can be. Uh, that, that there's no reason not to create a perfect... If you read the, the, uh, the Genesis account, it talks about the animals and they were given the plants for food. Strongly implying that, you know, they were originally vegetarian. And to go beyond that, you'll notice that in the New Earth, they're pretty much explicitly said to be vegetarian. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. You know, I'm not sure that the lion necessarily eats all straw. Some fruit maybe along with it, but, but the idea being that, 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 the, that the original plan appears to be one where dog eat dog is not operative. And the final plan is pretty explicitly said to be one where doggy dog is not operative. The little kids go in the viper's den. You know what happens if they do that now. You know, this is a whole different order of creation. And for God to do it the other way, when, number one, he could have done it without having long ages of predation. And number two, where he says he didn't do it with long ages of predation. Why are we challenging both of those unless we're stuck with the 800-pound gorilla? And I think that that... that that point has to be addressed. <coughs> and it's one that we've been trying to address in various ways uh, for some time. Well, there's, there's you know, if, if, for example, Jesus ate fish and was without sin, uh, uh, then the eating of flesh would be independent of sin in that sense. So, you know, there's still questions like that, that, that you know, what, where, where, where do you draw the line? So, and that's what, I'm, uh, you know, uh, what I mentioned mm -hmm. in terms of looking at a, a weak theistic evolution type uh, scenario is that you're, you're, you're trying to identify where those border lines are that, that, that address those, those types of questions. And that, that's a fair question. Um, it's just that I think that if you're going to go that way, you have to acknowledge that you have a problem and you have to deal with it. <clears throat> or you have to wave your hand and say, it will be dealt with, I don't know how. Which is basically a faith position. And I'm not saying that faith is wrong. You know, if I did that, why well, I couldn't be here. Uh, but I think that it needs to be said up front for what it is and not trying to pretend that it's part of science, if I can make, that, uh, make the point that way. Could you define the, the weak? Could someone define what is a weak theistic evolution? Well, actually, since you uh, brought it up, I probably should sure. let you define it as closely as you can. And, and realizing that there are vague there really edges is no that- There no definition, but there's, I'm just saying there's a range of questions uh, that deal with theistic evolution in, in which, uh, you know, was, you know, the questions like, was the earth completely sterile, you know, four, six thousand? You mean like, or, uh, were bacteria around before creation? Yeah, yeah, those kind of things. You know, just, you know, was, was there, because if there was life in the universe, there's no reason why there couldn't have been some form of life on this planet. And, um, and so, uh, you know, it's just, uh, and, and if, you know, uh, the eating of flesh is not, uh, you know, directly related to saying that's sinful, then, then um, uh, uh, you know, then there's those kind of considerations that, that 
go beyond you know the the, the view that, that you take in terms of the um, young young Earth um, perspective that um, uh, that would be legitimate to talk about. That's that's all I'm saying. Is that I'm I'm not saying that that God step back and just let things happen and let evolution go as as the scientific community describe it. Uh, God obviously intervened to create, you know, during Creation Week, and created, a, you know, an ideal place yes, yes. Uh, according to His will, and and so there's there's um, there's, a room, there's this area of discussion that would, you know, want to address those questions, and that's that's what I'm referring to. I just uh, was wondering if uh, that might uh, suggest what Jack Provencia, uh you know defended in a way in the case long ages could be proved be beyond any reasonable uh, uh, doubt. He, he suggested that uh, uh, although it's true that according to Paul sin entered through one man but as far as the universe is concerned sin entered through Lucifer and he said well who knows maybe Lucifer was uh, uh, out from uh, heaven, and he came to this earth, and then he be began experimenting with bacteria and things. Well, I, uh, I in a, in a short way, I have dealt with that in my chapter on um, uh, how long did it, uh, uh, when did creation occur, in um, understanding creation. Uh, dealt with that very question. And uh, so, you know, if you're if you're interested in looking at what I have to say, there, that's a that's a good place to look for it. Uh, perhaps one of these days we'll try to um, uh, do something on that in a in a more uh, and hopefully one that won't take as long to to give the original presentation, so I can make it a little bit shorter than that. But uh, yes. Um, just in response to Romans or wherever it talks about the earth um, groaning and waiting to be liberated or whatever, um, we don't talk much about God cursing the earth, but he did curse. And so whatever that was, you know, I think um, obviously the world is groaning because of the curse, and God took the blame for that. He is taking that blame of you know, he cursed the earth, and he allowed this to happen. Why? So we would feel a need for him, maybe, or so things would go faster, or whatever it is. Um. Uh, oh, the possibility is that if he had not cursed the earth, uh, we would have been actually worse off. Uh, uh, people who are people who are cocooned and never. Uh, given any negative feedback whatsoever, develop huge egos that are way outsized to their abilities. And uh, I, I think that's an important, an important thing that, that, you know, God actually, in trying to bring us up short, is trying to preserve something long term that otherwise would be lost. Um, if you want to pass a to the lady way back there. <laughs> but go ahead, in the meantime. Well, uh, just a light-headed uh, moment. Um, you folk mentioned a thousand years to the Lord is like one day, or uh, vice versa. Uh, maybe on, on November 4th, I got the entitlement to have a thousand years of rest, so I quit, decided to quit working. But anyways, um, you know, uh, I love the church. The Adventist Church, dearly, I'm a product of Adventism, Adventist uh, education, 17 years of my life. Um, and it's uh, very sad to see what's happening to our educational system in this country. Um, Adventism is very alive and is doing very well outside this country. Um, does our lack of a stance on our understanding of science and the scriptures have to do with this. 
so recently so many Adventist uh, schools were closed. And uh, you go to different places. I was in Ohio for 25 years. Mount Vernon Academy had 450 students at one time. Now they're struggling to have any students to keep it open. Uh, you destroy the Adventist educational system. You have destroyed the church. Very simple. Uh, and I think we need to wake up to this fact and see that uh, the church can do everything it can to uh, have the, uh, the school system be going and be strong. Um, where I work, um, work with some folk whose kids go to Cal Baptist, and uh, they have now 5,000 students. And, and I've met some of these kids who go there, and it's amazing what their commitment is. The reason why um, I believe why the Mormons are doing so well is that their young people are missionaries and they know what they believe in. They go all over the world. Uh, what is this? Those gone. Um, our schools used to be Emmanuel Missionary College and uh, uh, all missionary colleges, all missionary colleges. And College of Medical Evangelists. We want, to be, we want to be now like the world. We used to be very distinct Adventist folk at one time. Um, there's, a, there's a part of us that's uh, starting to try to go back to that, um, that um, Southern Adventists uh, University uh, deliberately put Adventist in there. And I think that was a, uh, that was a step forward. I think it's, it's a mistake when we try to make our names so that nobody can tell who's actually behind this. But uh, uh, I'll let uh, Bonnie have some comments and then. Uh, uh, the one in Washington in Silver Spring, is that Washington Adventist University now? I think that's correct. So we have at least two. Um, I was thinking about the first animal sacrifice at the gates of Eden when God made coats of skin for Adam and Eve after the fall. And it doesn't seem like there's anything in scripture that would put the death of animals or the eating of animals any earlier than after sin. I, I would agree with that. Uh, certainly the, the biblical record does uh, seems to imply that that's the first time. And then for there to be seven versus two for the clean and the unclean uh, animals that went onto the ark was another indication that because the vegetation had been destroyed and they were going to need something to eat, that it wasn't part of the original plan to be eating meat. I think there have been some very good questions raised. I look forward to us attacking the 800-pound gorilla and get, helping me have a better understanding because we all struggle with some of those things. And so I look forward to us having a more in-depth discussion on several of these issues because there have been some really good questions raised. Um, well, we will. Uh, are you ready for some more on paraconformities? <laughs> we'll see what we can do to, to, to bring some of those back that we've covered way back when, but if, uh, probably it's a good idea to come back to them. Um, and uh, I, I think it's important because I think that if, as long as we're afraid that that uh, scientific evidence is overwhelming and we just have to give up, then we're stuck with some kind of strong or weak form of theistic evolution or just giving the whole thing up because after all, you know, what's the credibility of what you've got? Uh, now, I don't think you need to go there right away, but then maybe you don't need to go there at all if you're paying a little more attention to what the scientific evidence actually shows. I, and I'd I'm like to propose amazed. that will come that way. I'm amazed at the people that sit around like Dawkins and have their own little group and pat themselves all on the back that they're the superior intellect to everyone else and around as they tell themselves that this we have the, the evidence and so forth, and they, but they totally ignore a bunch of the evidence that doesn't go with their theory, but while meanwhile they degrade the people that don't agree with them and they sit around and pat themselves on the back saying how superior intellect they have. Your video from last week demonstrated that attitude, um, the one that went viral. 
well, sit, they just sit there and say, we're just superior to the rest of you and we just know better and, and they propagate that. And, and yet there are some serious issues they totally fail to address in their own theory, which if they were intellectually superior, they would be forced to address those as a matter of conscience and scientific integrity. Well, I guess it's easier to sit around and say we're just smarter than everybody else. That's why we believe this. Well, it's particularly easy to do that if everybody around you that you consider important and knowledgeable and, uh, and uh, having the right education says that to you. Um, next week, uh, we're still, I'm, I'm still trying to see whether we can make a complete one out of uh, a new article that suggests that, uh, that uh, not by a creationist, by the way, that suggests that as time has gone on, we're uh, getting stupider, literally. Uh, well, we could, yeah, we could, well, we could fit Sanford's in with that, I think. Um, and uh, it's, it's fascinating uh, material, and uh, uh, it, it actually fits in with Sanford quite well. Some of us have known this all the time.